Okay, good evening. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's two minutes to seven, so we're going officially live in a couple of minutes. Welcome to the panelists. Welcome to our MC for the evening, Lisa Klotz. Thank you, Dan. Welcome, Mr. Johnson. Welcome to the two Karens. Welcome to Meryl and welcome to Jody. I know that Lorraine is joining any second now. She was just trying to find the correct link. So she's going to be with us any moment now. We have about 150 people already in the audience and that number's going up. So welcome to all of you at home. Okay, I'm sure by now you know how a webinar works. We can't see you. You can see us. We're on the stage here. You're in the audience and you can interact with us via the Q&A and via the chat. So the chat feature is active. I see that we've already got a message in the chat from Kaj saying, hi, everyone. You can pop us a message in the chat and you can ask specific questions during the evening through the Q&A feature. Okay, as you can see, I'm bundled up here. I'm ready to climb Mount Everest because it's, uh, I don't know if it's just me, but it feels like a massive cold front has hit. <laughs> so I've bundled up every layer that I could find, including this. So Lisa, you've landed yourself in a role as MC. You didn't think that would happen this evening. I didn't think I'd be talking at all, but I'm very happy to be the MC and introduce these amazing panelists. So I'm glad to have the opportunity. Thank you. Of course. And uh, Meryl, welcome Meryl. You can unmute yourself. You've become a webinar, a seasoned webinar veteran. Uh, I'm doing one webinar. How many have I done? Two. That makes me an officiado. No, I think I'm getting there and I enjoy it. But it's fun. Good stuff. Good stuff. I, I wanted to ask the panelists, and maybe we can ask the audience as well, just while we wait uh, to officially begin in the next minute or two and we wait for Lorraine. Um, have you guys registered for Simon Sinek on Thursday night? Do you want to know from the panelists or yes. from the... Yes, I want to see yes. thumbs up from the absolutely. panelists. Good, good, good. It's going to be absolutely amazing. We've had over two and a half thousand people register. So very, very exciting. If anybody still needs the link to register for that, I'm going to post that in the chat because you might be interested. So I'll put that in the chat for you. Okay, so... And if I can just add that, I think that will help people a lot in everything we're talking about. I think, Dan, you know, I think that Simon Sinek speaks to everything that we're going to be talking about tonight. Fantastic. Uh, so, guys, on the panel, uh, has anybody got word from, from Lorraine? Is she winning? Let's check that out. Is she in the... There ah, we go. There we oh, go. Oh, she's Not joined yet. us, Jodie Starkovitz. So I'm going to do her a favor and change her name so we don't get confused. Uh, you joined us, me. I don't know why it does that. Okay, I think it's because it's, uh, she used Jodie's link to join, but it's all good. Not a bad so, idea. <laughs> Welcome, Lorraine. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Okay. There we go. There we go. So we sorted. So, so guys, a very warm welcome to all the panelists and welcome to everyone watching at home. I see over 300 people, over 300 logins at the moment. And uh, I'm sure more people are going to join in the next minute or two. But what we're going to do is before I hand over to our esteemed MC, Lisa Klotz, I'm going to show a video of back to school matrix at King David High School, Linksfield. Okay, so Let's take a look at what's been going on at the high school.
Okay, so clearly it's great to be back. And it's great to be back on the panel. Lisa, you are our MC, so I'm going to hand over to you and I'm going to fade into the background and we're going to hear from each of our panelists one by one and then we're going to have a Q&A. And to those of you who have just joined us, welcome, welcome. I'm sure it's not the first webinar that you've been on, so you're probably familiar with it by now. But just as a reminder, you can post all questions into the Q&A section. You can access that at the bottom of your Zoom window and you can chat with us uh, as well on uh, through the chat. So you can post any chat messages through the chat and questions through the Q&A. Okay, great stuff. So Lisa, over to you. Thank you so much, Dan. Hello, everyone, and welcome to 2020 2.0. This is our second attempt at bringing the 2020 academic school year onto our campus. And now that we are one week and one day in, we are so happy to share our experiences with you and to be able to tell you what has been happening for us and to open up to questions as well, if there are any at the end. We know how things should look, but it's very different in practice. So we're very grateful to have this opportunity. And I just want to thank Dan Stillerman for everything that he does for us and to our own Jody Starkovitz for helping set this up. Um, our panelists tonight are going to be our principal, Lorraine Schrager, who's going to talk about learning to fly. As our commander, she's going to share with us insights of being the head of school and all that that means. We also have our senior deputy principal, Mr. Tom Johnson, who's going to talk about, hello Tom, who's going to talk about the practical side of setting up the standard operating procedures to go back to school. We have Karen Bachrach, who's going to talk about the galaxy of opportunities for learning. And um, there's going to be a hybrid approach, which we are following, and Karen will explain that. We have Karen Horowitz, one of our educational psychologists, who's going to talk about articulation and attitude control. That's going to be um, about the feelings and the losses and all the things that is happening emotionally. And then to close, we have Meryl Malkin, who's going to talk about gravity and the forces that pull us together and how things work going back to school after all this time. Um, and after that, we'll have an opportunity for questions. So without further ado, Lorraine, Mashraga, over to you. Right. Thank you to you, Lisa, to you, Dan, as always, for being such a wonderful host and a friend to the King David schools, um, and to um, all the panelists, um, to, to the two social workers and the two um, educational psychologists for pushing me to do this and a little bit out of my comfort zone, and certainly to, um, to you, Tom Johnson, my senior deputy principal. I think that um, learning to fly has been a lot harder than I thought it would ever be. And um, I'm not sure that um, being a pilot is what I would choose as a, as a career going forward. But my brief is to talk about what it's been like to steer this ship, this space shuttle. And um, I, I just want to, to say that although I'm speaking on behalf of King David Linksfield, I know that I speak on behalf of all all my friends and colleagues of the other 10 schools that fall under the SABGE. We all share um, a common um, uh, bond. Um, it's been amazing to work with them so that we can all talk about what it's been like and, and, and really um, I think that's made us um, a little bit stronger. But I think that it would be important to just give some kind of context to an all Normal school year, which should be 20. Um, Pro-COVID, we, we had certainty in many, many ways. Um, our schools, being schools, are always fluid, and I don't believe that any one day ever looks like another. But the reality is there were certainties that we knew. Um, we know that the King David school system, there's nothing that's black and white, and that's what makes our school so magnificent and because of the tapestry of our students and staffing body. But we are certain of many things. We were. Academically, we knew how to run a school. 
Academically, we knew what was best for our students. We were able to bring innovative ideas to the table. We had time. We could think about it. We could reflect on it. We knew when exams would be. We knew what a timetable would look at. We knew when our sports matches would be, and we waited with anticipation for the sporting winter season and all the many, many cultural activities that all our schools enjoy. And all of them were diarised and we couldn't wait for them to come. And I actually, while looking at my diary, some of those things come up all the time and it just seems so unbelievable that we're not having, we're not doing that at the moment. Um, and this is the rhythm that we as heads of school understand. For the most part, we are experts. And for the most part, our parents, our students, and our staff turn to us. Turn to us for advice, how to run certain things, and what to do. But then everything changed. On the 24th of March, we closed school, and no longer was the sky clear, or the waters for that matter, and suddenly we were forced into negotiating suddenly things that we didn't understand. We didn't have time to reflect. We didn't have time to think about it. And more importantly, we didn't have time to plan. And if you listen to most clinical psychologists, and I am certainly not one, but we have all been faced with a trauma. And as one clinical psychologist said, trauma with a T. It has been unprecedented. As I said, we were not prepared for it. We had no idea what this thing was. And suddenly we all had to take our schools onto un online schooling, remote schooling, but I think more crisis schooling. What was this that we had to do? We had matric group that were in the middle of prelims. How were we going to get them through the year? What were we going to do? Pre-primary school teachers were unsure, grade one teachers, grade seven teachers, and we had no time to sit down and think about how to maximize and to execute it. And therein started this real roller coaster of what it means to head a school. We managed this amidst much anxiety, much fear, and much confusion. We no longer understood the way things would be executed. We no longer understood how to run examinations or what would happen to our timetable. The stress levels of our staff heightened, understandably, and the more they heightened, the more impact we felt trying to manage their anxieties, our own anxieties, our students' anxieties, and our own families' anxieties. We had to try and explain to children that their options were really limited. They couldn't come to school. And that when they would one day come to school, which they have in the last week, they'd have to have social distancing, they'd have to wear a mask, they'd have to sanitize. Options which are really not options. And we as heads just kept smiling, pretending that everything was normal and this is the way that things should be. However, stress, anxiety, fear. Our group, our heads group, the King David Heads group, we just we, we, I think that is the most used word that we've had over the last couple of weeks. And also having to make decisions, decisions that we believe today are the right decisions, but not knowing that tomorrow they will be the right thing. And so one of the terms that, been, that has been termed and, and coined is decision fatigue. We make the decision with every best interest of our students and of our staff. And then we change them. What can we do? There has never ever been a precedent like this in the last hundred years. And therein lies the, the confusion. Thank God we have wonderful colleagues and friends and I have 10 other heads of schools that were able to try and navigate this uncertain time as best as we can. But just when you think that you're dealing with community, you need to understand that we don't just deal with community. We deal with the government, the Department of Education, Health and Safety, Umalusi, the IEB, 
and as Victory Park would know today, the police. And all of this is a juggle. We, we were never ever trained to do any of this. And as I probably don't have to tell anybody, most times none of these departments actually understand what's going on or actually even coordinate with themselves. And so we juggle and we juggle and we try our hardest. Every night, the stress levels are just higher. And I think another thing that adds to all the real confusion is this limbo. I spoke to one matric parent who said, we don't even know when the final examinations will be written. Are prelims going to be at the same time? Will there be a matric dance? And I think that that limbo is a huge torture because as human beings, we all want to know. We all want to know that even if things at this stage are really, really hard, there is something at the end of the tunnel or when, when, we, when it happens. And at this stage, we really, really don't know. Also, last week, we made finally the decision that our grade 12s and grade 7s would return. Well, just as it is, we were faced with many opinions views, thoughts, some concerns, fears, and judgments. And we as heads needed to address all of these that parents had expressed to us. Um, and I need to, I need, you know, and all we can say is that we're doing the best we can. And I guess in an ideal world, what the best would be is that every single individual's needs are taken into consideration. But this certainly isn't an ideal world at the moment. And all that I can say is that all we can do to navigate this period of such uncertain skies, and I have to use that analogy, is that we need to collaborate. We need to understand where everything is coming from. And we need to believe as a community that we act for the better good. I know that we all face, myself and my friends and colleagues, we all face many angry, rude parents, emails that are unbelievably elicited with, with, with real anger as if we were the responsible for COVID. But we understand you. We understand where it's coming from. The fear, the anxiety, they're your children. And we're saddled with that burden and responsibility to look after them. But all I can ask you is that your own frustrations, your own fears will be dealt with if we can all work together with a full understanding that we simply are trying our best in a time that nobody has any real answers. Um, sorry. So while we continue to navigate the return of our beautiful children today, grade ones and grade one, 12, uh, grade ones and R's returned. Remember that we are doing so with the most utmost care for our special community and that we want everybody to be safe. And it does not serve anybody if we cannot work together with that kind of understanding. Finally, as I cautiously as well as other heads navigate these real scary skies, I still believe that there are infinite, infinite possibilities that we can take out of this. New creativity. If I look at the beautiful work that so many of our students have done over this period, from creating an online Haggadah to being able for us to celebrate Yom Atzma'ut, to commemorate Yom HaShoah and Yom, ha Yom HaZikaron. Yom Yerushalayim was a magnificent celebration. The most beautiful Gimelut Chasidim that I, has chesed that our children have done over this period. All the committees that have brought, whether it be physical education to the, to the screens or an awareness of what is happening around us. And our staff, so often, the unsung heroes who have been able to adapt in a way that they also didn't know. They have shown growth, 
the ability to cope, to deal with stress, to stretch themselves because we care about your children. And so while I try to steer our beautiful ship to make sure that we get to the destination that we all pray for, I can only say that um, it's a hard journey. It's a difficult one. It's not something as a head of school that I ever believed that I needed to deal with, but we're doing it. And we're doing it because we are a magnificent community that deserves only the best. And so lastly, to you, the parents that are listening, bear with us, just give us time. It's only been a week, and as, as Lisa said, a week and one day, we'll get there and we'll have a soft landing and everybody will achieve their potential. I thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Shraga. Um, we are so privileged to have you as our commander. You spoke about fear and you spoke about confusion, but we've never seen you look fearful and we've never seen you look confused. So we are just so grateful and thank you for your words and for the encouragement that you've given to the parents. Um, we are going to hand over now to Mr. Johnson, your, your co-pilot in all of this. And we are going to hear about the practicalities of setting up a school for return. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson, you just need to unmute yourself there. Thought it was automatic. Very warm welcome to the parents and all the students this evening. And thank you, Lisa, for the introduction. Um, we had a very successful uh, reopening with the matrix last week. And this, this was based on expectations that we put on to the matric students, whereby we had asked for a very positive attitude to face a difficult challenge upon the return. To take the responsibility for their own health, safety, and behavior whilst at school. Try and be measured, not overreactive, calm and respectful towards each other. In essence, they were to be self-controlled and they really did step up to the plate with regards to this. So we had 130 matrics that returned last week. We are anticipating anything close on 150 uh, grade 11s to be coming next week. So uh, that being said, let me try and paint a picture and walk you through what you can anticipate upon your arrival at the school at the Bedford Street gate. As Lisa said before, we are following the standard operational uh, operating procedures as laid down by the board, which is on the advice of the government as well. When the students alight from their cars outside of the gate, they'll be walking towards the pedestrian area, which is a route which is clearly labeled. Once through there, they're walking towards the inside of the school, whereby they will be confined by a barrier which se separates them from the vehicles that are coming in and out of the school. There are two rows that have been set up with social spacing initially at the gate, it's at a two minute, a two meter interval. You will then approach the members of staff who have been specifically trained to be in a position to process you, reduce your anxiety. They are waiting to welcome you. It's been a long time since many of you have been to the school. The first thing that you would be asked is a three-point questionnaire. The following questions. One, have you or anyone in your family recently had any of the following symptoms? Fever, cough, sore throat, shortness of breath. Two, do you have any body aches, loss of smell or taste, nausea, diarrhea, fatigue, weakness or tiredness? And three, have you or any of your family been in contact with anyone that has tested or positive or awaiting results for COVID-19 within the last 14 days? The answer to these questions is a simple yes and yes or no. Having completed the questionnaire, you, the students will then move on and have their temperatures taken by a non-contacting uh, thermometer. They then pass on down the line to the next member of staff who will sanitize the hands. To, for, the, for the grade 11s that return, uh, two new masks will be issued. Uh, they are three-ply and every student will be issued with them. I'm sure that you will arrive with your mask on anyway, 
that the, the, the school is going to provide two masks. Once you've done that, you, you are going to present yourself for registration, and then you are logged in on a spreadsheet. We were able to look at the model that we set up last week, and it was clear that by asking the questions, things began to move quite slowly. So we printed the questions out, small question as, and they were then given in batches to the students. So they make their declaration before they arrive at the school. And once they have done that, it's a matter of presenting that, that information, recording their temperature on there, and then they are registered. Students who arrive in cars are also welcome onto the campus. They just simply follow the different route, but they're processed in exactly the same way. And then both parties can merge and then pass into the school. If the case is that we have a temperature which exceeds 37.5, then that student will be taken discreetly to one side, uh, onto the, a, a quarantine area, placed with a member of staff, and then for the next five minutes, just monitor the student and then retake the temperature to see if there was some other reason, maybe the ambient temperature was a little bit uh, high, perhaps she came from a car, and that's given a false reading. So we'll be patient on that and see if we can accommodate the student. If not, parents will have to be contacted and the student then will be asked to, to go home. Um, we're moving then into the school. So now everyone is moving down towards the, the swimming pool area. And, and here we are looking at starting lessons at eight o'clock for, for matrix, nine o'clock for the majority of the school. And therefore, we need to arrive 30 minutes before time. So certain matrics that have Afrikaans got in the early morning lesson, they're coming in at 7.30. And then the rest of the school can come anywhere between, uh, let's say, 8.15 and half past eight, and then going through. The teams will be on the gate until the best part of nine o'clock, whereupon they are withdrawn because many of them are going to be teaching and have other functions as well. Uh, any students who arrive late, they must, they would be processed by the guards on the gate, and then please would you make your way down to um, Debbie Jacobs in the office, and again, you would be formally registered. So you're moving into the school. Let me give you an indication of the setup and the layout here. And I've, let me just say here from the outset that everything has been designed to lessen risk. We're obviously trying to minimize the risk of contact here because that's how the disease is spread. And with that in mind, we have gone to use the larger bases, the larger classrooms, labs, computer rooms, mini hall, auditorium, all familiar to, to everyone here once we move in. As the number of students comes back, it has been necessary, therefore, to convert many of the other uh, teaching bases over uh, on the E block and the W block, where therefore we've got a maximum of 20 desks, the rectangular desks have replaced the uh, the, those um, trapezoid desks so that we can get 20 in at a spacing again of one and a half meters. There are markers outside of the classroom and again I'm saying that we will have the best part of another 11 classrooms coming online next week for a much larger group of grade 11s. Now to further minimize contact a one-way system has been designed in the S block. So in entering the S block, which is a, a three level building, you would enter either via the mini hall side or via the data midrash. It's clearly signposted. You're going up the stairs onto the first or second floor. Once you've had your lesson, then leave. But you can leave by the gable end, that's the, of the western side, that's by the swimming pool and down the fire escape or you make your way towards the tuck shop end and then down the staircase there. It's a very, very difficult thing uh, to, to get through your head. I teach in the S block and I constantly come out of my room and I've got to check myself. So you've got to try and inculcate. Students have got to really work towards inculcating good behavior within their routine for the day. The lessons are 50 minutes in length. Uh, the 10 minutes that they have before the next lesson, one, they pack up, prepare to leave. But before they do, they are given a sheet of uh, paper, paper toweling, 
the desks then is sprayed and they must sanitize their own desks, throw the paper in the waste bin, and then they are allowed out of the class again at one and a half meters. So they have a staggered withdrawal from that. When it comes to breaks, there are two breaks on Monday and Tuesday, and then one for the rest of the week. The tuck shop obviously has been closed for this particular period of time. But the areas that are open for the, for the social uh, setup of break time would be the tuck shop area, the area in front of Mrs. DeVette's uh, computer lab, and for the, uh, and, and the admin block for those, uh, for those matric students. But further to that, for the grade 11s when they return, we are looking at the grade 10 gross area, the W block, and then going down towards uh, the, the, um, the biology labs. So everyone has to be spread out. Clearly, marks, markings have been placed down there in all of these areas. Students will now be allowed to remove their masks to have their refreshments. There is to be no sharing of refreshments, and at the same time, we are not going to be taking any deliveries. Uh, all waste is the responsibility of the individual, and therefore it must be placed in the bin when we've finished. At all times, we are looking for good hygiene, good respiratory hygiene, especially when coughing. Cough into the cuff of the, of, of the elbow, likewise use tissues and dispose of them uh, in, in due course. At this time, this is when students will go to the bathrooms and the, the members of staff are on duty right throughout both of the breaks so that they can go around, interact with the students, answer their questions, and just make sure that the social distancing is actually being maintained. The departure is something similar at the end of the day. There will be a, a, an orderly and staggered departure over a few minutes so that the students can make their way towards the gates to meet the parents and we haven't allowed any gatherings. So, so far, everything along those lines have been running very, very smoothly. As I said before, late arrivals must come down to Debbie to, to log in A, their temperature and to register their presence. What has proved to be a little bit difficult is the wearing of masks. Everyone is battling with this because of the length of the day that the masks must be worn. There cannot be closure. There cannot be games. And therefore, some of the expectations of the students, unfortunately, they clearly haven't been met. Um, but we do have to maintain this. The self-control is absolutely essential. We cannot allow them to, to do what it is they want. And I think here is a special role for parents that have a conversation with the sons and daughters and absolutely insist that if you're coming to school, you have to abide by the rules and cooperate fully. Uniforms uh, are not going to be worn at this moment in time. You're in civvies, you're in casuals. So uh, just make sure that the clothing you are wearing is very warm. Last Friday, there must have been a couple of degrees frost on the primary school field. Students were coming in t-shirts and shirts, they must have been freezing. It also creates a little bit of a problem for recording temperatures as well. But providing that we're working together here in a cooperative and productive way and exercising some flexibility around difficult, difficult circumstances with patients, we certainly will have a successful growing school. So thank you all for that. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you so much, Mr. Johnson. It is clear that you are the real deal. We are so lucky that we have the genuine Scotland Yard setting up our beautiful establishment. And it really has worked up until now. So thank you. Thank you. Karen Bachrach, um, one of our educational psychologists and part of our ed support department is going to be up next. Karen. Thanks, Lisa. Good evening, everyone. I think one of the real challenges everyone has faced and that COVID has brought with us is uncertainty. And that uncertainty has led to a sense of being out of control, which is in a, a very difficult space to be in. So while everyone was under lockdown, 
there was a sense of time moving very, very quickly, but we often felt as if we were standing still. We didn't move time. We didn't go into a classroom. We didn't change classes. We didn't have sport activities after school. So while time was going, we felt unproductive, as if we weren't really achieving anything. For the matrics who've gone back to school, there are still matrics who are working from home for many reasons. And this is the hybrid approach that has been spoken about. Going forward, there will be lessons at school. And in the later afternoon, there'll be lessons that take place at home. I think it's important to schedule time in a way that you start to feel like you are in control. As if you have a sense of what you're doing. And a really good way to do that is to use a work schedule, a planner. And I think it's important to use a piece of paper. I think we're so involved in technology and working on technology, but working on a piece of paper gives you the sense of something tangible, something you can actually feel and work on. So there is an example up on all the groups on their teams under general that you can actually see a planner that helps you schedule your time, schedule what you need to do. And with exams coming up fairly soon for the grade eights to 11s, it's a good time to start planning and seeing what you need to do when you're going to do it. It doesn't change because you're going back to school. Plan around your day, your timetable. I think one of the most important things is then to tick off each of the things that you have planned to do. And that little tick is going to give you a sense of being in control. And once you feel in control, you're able to cope with all the challenges and changes that are still going to be facing us each and every day, all the way until the end of COVID, which hopefully will be sooner rather than later. Thanks, Lise. Thank you so much, Care. Please God, sooner rather than later. From one Karen to the next. I'd like to introduce Karen Horowitz, another one of our educational psychologists and part of our Ed Support Department. Karen Horowitz. Thanks, Lise, and good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Um, I read a quote the other night, which I thought was so apt. It said something about, um, right now, all of our souls feel a little sick. And um, I thought that was so apt when discussing returning to school and the feelings that go with it and all of our feelings regarding COVID-19. So I wanted to comment, just give a few pointers on what sort of normal feelings would be at the moment for all of us, parents, educators, and children. And then Meryl is going to talk a little bit about managing those feelings. So firstly, I want to say that there's nothing that's normal here. We are all having normal reactions to something that's very abnormal. And I can't bear it when people talk about the new normal because there is nothing normal about this. Um, and it's quite devastating sometimes to see children walking around with masks, masks and social distancing. However, it is what it is and we need to know and understand what it is that we can expect in our children, um, what are the kinds of things we, we may be seeing, obviously knowing that everybody is a little bit different and might respond or react differently, um, and then we're going to talk about managing it. So firstly, I think what we really need to understand is that we are all dealing with trauma. Um, none of this is normal, we're not used to it. We are having to manage ambiguity, as Ms. Shraga spoke about, tolerating it, not knowing what's going to happen. Our lives have changed. Our routines have changed. Um, nothing is what it was, and we're not sure when it ever will be again. Um, so given that, it, I almost see it as like um, this trauma is the, a program running in the background in our computer all the time. And it's those programs that take away speed and um, and clarity when our computer's running. This trauma is, is, is underlying everything and we just need to know that and recognize it. Um, so once we can realize that we can understand that what does trauma do? Um, remember that trauma actually activates our fight flight response. 
our nervous system is now not responding in the same way anymore. And we may see some very, very different things in our children, remembering that they more than likely on high alert at this stage. Um, they're in fight flight and they don't know what to expect and how it's going to be and when this threat might reach them. So firstly, um, on a physiological level, um, we may see um, issues that arise in sleeping, maybe not sleeping as per normal, um, changes in eating patterns, um, attention span being difficult. Remember, if we're in fight flight response, um, we're not concentrating like we used to. We're in a state of hyper arousal and hyper vigilance, looking for the next threat. Um, and sometimes difficulty in regulating feelings. Um, so what we're going to see on an emotional level are things like denial. Um, a lot of our metrics have come back with a sort of idea that it was going to be as it was. And in fact, it hasn't been anything like that. And that's been a really, really hard thing. They can't hug their friends, they can't play ball games in the same kind of way anymore. Um, and that's come as, as, a, as a shock in a way. Um, anger with because of that. And sometimes with anger, you see acting out behavior. So defiance, um, rebelliousness. The other kinds of things are anxiety, um, some very mixed feelings, um, excitement to come back to school, but also anxiety about it. Um, also, um, how will our friendships be? Are they going to be the same? We haven't been um, together in the same kind of way. Where do I fit in? So there's anxiety around that. And also a real sense of loss. Loss of all the things, as Ms. Shraga spoke about, that were expected, how we thought they were going to be. The dances, the events. And, and, and there's a sadness that goes with that. And then, of course, comes with it shame and guilt for feeling those things. So feeling, well, why should I be feeling cross and upset and angry so feeling guilty about that. But actually, those are really, really normal feelings. Everybody's lives have changed. So a whole lot of things can come to the surface. And they can be spoken about, or sometimes we actually just see it in the behavior that the children manifest. Um, so we are, we're not always sure, and it's really, really important to keep in mind what some of those things are and what might be going on in the background, that background program that's running. I'm going to hand over to Meryl, who's going to talk more about that. Thanks, Lisa. Meryl Malkin is our head of department, and she's our resident webinar professional. Meryl is going to speak about, is going to carry on speaking about what Karen mentioned. Meryl, over to you. Hi, everybody. Can you see me? Am I on camera? <laughs> and hear me. Okay. So hi, everybody. Welcome. It's so exciting that you are all part of this webinar. And I'm so happy that we get to speak to you like this. Um, thanks to everybody who's gone before me. And I hope that I'm not going to repeat everybody. I'm going to try to go quickly because I know that there are a lot of questions that parents have. And that's more important. So I want to start by saying that we to keep within our space um, theme, that we're all on a voyage of discovery into uncharted territory, and we're all exploring this new frontier together. Nobody knows anything for sure, as everybody said. So I think for parents, for students, if any are listening, that you need to give yourself and, and others permission to not have all the answers. We're all doing our best. You as parents are doing your best, the students are doing the best, um, and the school's doing the best. So for me, it's to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. There's nobody out there who's trying to make this difficult for anybody else. We're all feeling anxious. Parents are feeling anxious, as everybody said. The students are feeling anxious. And there is so much free-floating anxiety out there, as if we were in space with no gravity and all those stars and nothing is, nothing is grounded. So I think that... We, we need to understand that everybody is going through this, this difficult time. So with all these feelings out there, what do we do with these feelings? Because there's so much 
um, you know, out there, say your feelings, experience your feelings, tell your children to, to ex you express their feelings. And the minute you do that, somebody shuts you down. Stop it. You're so lucky. You've got a beautiful, warm, you know, house and a roof over your head. So I think that what happens, we're scared to hear other people's feelings because we have got our own feelings and then it's really hard to hold our children's feelings. So the minute somebody starts talking about their feelings, we try and give them solutions. We try and tell them what the reason is not to have those feelings. So for me, it's like taking a big, if you think of feelings like a big um, beach ball that you try and sit on and you try and keep those feelings down and you have to put in a lot of effort to keep those feelings down and eventually they just pop up. We have explosions. We believe we have the right to shout at people, to be rude. Um, because we haven't had an opportunity to express those feelings in an appropriate and comfortable way. So I think that what happens is that, and we have that with the kids at school, we act out. We haven't said what we need to, we need to say. So for me, we need to acknowledge firstly our own feelings. Okay, and just to say that there are mainly four feelings that we all have. It's not so difficult. Mad, sad, glad, and bad. And for me, what started happening is that people have said to me, you can't have your feelings. They're not okay. So I, have, I don't even know what I feel anymore. So what I've tried to do is find the spaces in my body that are feeling sore, acknowledge where I'm feeling sore. My shoulders are so sore. I feel like I'm carrying the weight of the world. That's hard. That is a hard, bad feeling sometimes to have. Maybe it's making me sad. So I work from my body inwards. Once you've acknowledged your own feelings, and you've said it's okay to have these feelings, it's okay, you can then move on to holding your child's feelings and give them the opportunity to, hold, to talk about them. So the first thing I suggest is that we actually allow our children to talk about their feelings. They're not great at it and they don't like doing it. But sometimes you can be the person who actually says the words for them. So once we've had the discussion with our children, I'm telling you that is going to make our, children's feel be our children feel better and make you feel a bit better because we all feel these, these feelings that Karen so beautifully outlined. So some of the steps to do, okay, is to have the discussion about how they're feeling, how everybody's feeling, and that it is very hard not to know what's coming next. To have a discussion at school is going to be the same but different. It feels very surreal. When you come back to school for the first time, it's going to feel different. How's that going to be for you? For the kids that aren't coming back to school, how's that for you? Knowing that some of your friends are back at school while others of us are not. It's hard, okay? For both lots, it's hard. Um, Lisa used an amazing analogy with her child and she said, you know, it's like, you know that you liked Coke, but I didn't think Coke was such a good idea for you and I let you have some diet Coke because it doesn't have sugar. But you, it wasn't exactly the same, but it was similar and it tasted lovely, but it wasn't exactly the same. It was still good, but not the same. And that's how it's going to be when you go back to school. Um, I think that's an important step. I think um, if you do, when you are coming back, many of our kids have not actually been out of the houses yet. They haven't felt what it's like to be in the world around them. So I think a very important step is to get your kids out of the house. To actually, uh, because exercising now is you can do it differently, is to let them get out of the house, to get comfortable with you wearing a mask, seeing people with the masks on, um, get familiar with this kind of Thing. And um, I know for the younger grades, with some of the teachers, it's actually to show them what their teacher is going to look like wearing a mask. What's happened? Oh, gosh. Please? Am I out of time? You can carry on for another minute. Okay. I know that for the one is so important and the practical okay. steps to going back to school. Because there's only literally like two more. Um, you heard that Mr. Johnson gave us all the, the, he familiarized us with the school procedure. I think it's very important to familiarize your children with the school procedure. And lastly, as Mr. Johnson said, I think that it is really important to discuss why it's important for children to socially distance.
I think that they need to understand that this is a rule that the school put there for their, because we want you to be cruel or unkind, but really it's about looking after themselves and looking after the people in their lives and their families. So um, just to say that I know it's very hard. If you have any questions, please, we're saying to you, we want to make it better for you, for your kids, for everybody, for the, for the students out there that are listening. Please don't talk about it to your friends. Come and ask us. We want to hear what you have to say, and we will try our very level best to make it work for everybody. As Ms. Raga said, we can't make it individualized for each person, but we're going to try our best to do it. So please be in touch with us. Let us know when it isn't working for you, and we will try and take steps to improve the situation. And finally, let me just say that see, we are going into the stars. The sky's the limit. As Ms. Raga said, there are so many beautiful things that have happened, so much creativity, and let's strive for that. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Meryl. That was amazing. I think that most of the questions, um, even though a lot of us are counsellors, the questions around feelings and the questions around the mad and the sad and the bad and the glad often need to be done off of a webinar. So we are available to anyone that needs to discuss that. The questions that we have are more practical. So these are more directed towards Ms. Raga and Mr. Johnson. The first question we have is, what will the procedure be when a child tests positive? Does the entire school close down and how do you determine close contacts? Ms. Shraga? Um, from what we understand um, from, from other schools, um, I think the schools will close for two weeks. Um, there has been a discussion around will the schools close or won't they close? But we are um, aware of the fact that a, an independent school in Johannesburg um, had four matrics that had um, tested positive and they have closed for two weeks. So I think that would probably be um, what, what, what we would do. Um, and obviously we would want to, um, to, to trace where these kids have been. And I think that one of the most important things, and just to reiterate what Tom said, is that we have to act responsibly. To believe that it's not going to hit us as a community would be absolutely naive. And we have to keep remembering that we are still on level three. And the kids cannot be socializing in the way that they would be under normal circumstances. I know many of our matrics are turning 18 or have already turned 18, and the desire for parties and just not to be bored on a Saturday night. I get it and, and, and I feel we all have that feeling of grief and loss of what has happened. But I think that if we really look and we think about our blessings, we can see that more importantly, we are healthy, our families are healthy and our children are healthy and that's the most important thing. Thank you, Ms. Shaka. Can I just add to that, Lisa, please? I, I endorse 100% what Lorraine has got to say there. Um, I, I think if in, in terms, if, if a child was to fall in outside of the school, that would be exactly the case. If a child were to in some way fall ill during school, then we do have the sick, one of the sick base converted over to a quarantine area. So that, that, that student would be again sensitively taken there. And it is up to the occupational health and safety representative, which is myself with certain, a different type of protective clothing, to go in there to ask legitimate questions. So there's a whole questionnaire that is therefore to be filled in. And then the decision is made as to what the assessment is going to be. Uh, if, if it turns out to be uh, a positive, then we would actually contact the, the COVID team down at the board. And that's under the guidance there of uh, Mr. Um, Dean Witz. He's the health and safety professional that consults with us. And on the advice of that group, we would then go forward. In terms of the school closing, absolutely. Tracing is essential. And then again, a deep cleansing of the whole school would take place before it would reopen up again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. There are a lot of questions about when other grades are returning. Are the grade 11s next? Will they have to wear school uniform or civvies when they do come on campus? Ms. Raga, would you like to answer those as a whole? 
Yeah, so um, we, we are awaiting um, confirmation from the Department of Education that we would be able to bring our grade 11s back. Um, and we would like to bring them as back as quickly as possible um, because we know how um, crucial this grade 11 year is. I'm very, very nervous to give it anything definite. Um, we don't know from one day to the next. All I can say is that um, we, we are hoping within the next two weeks that the grade 11s will return. As far as the rest of the school is concerned, um, we, we're a really, really big school. Um, we have, for example, in our grade 11 year, um, 200 students. I know that Mr. Baker in grade 11 only has 54. So we have different capacities and we will have a different march in terms of what we can do. And I will only bring a grade back when I know that we have the capacity to ensure that every single student is safe on campus. My guess is that the grade eights, nines and tens will only return after the July holidays. Um, but as I said, I am so reluctant to make promises. We're going into winter. I saw that there were quite a few questions around the cold front, which um, I can't be responsible for that one, but yes, the cold front is coming. And so we don't know um, what, what, what will happen um, in the winter, in the real height of the winter. I'm sure there are teach, um, parents that are wishing to get their kids back as soon as possible. And we would love to have everyone back. I miss, I miss the noise. I miss the smiles. I miss everybody. And, but I'm not willing at this stage to give a definite just because we simply don't know and would be irresponsible. Thank you, Ms. Shraga. Karen Horowitz, I'm going to direct this question towards you because you are in the situation and you're probably best equipped to answer. There's a question, um, if you could please speak a little bit about how siblings at home might be feeling when older siblings have gone to school and they've been left alone. Um, yeah, so I have a son in matric, so he's gone back and a son in grade eight. Um, Look, I think it's going to depend on the child. So for some children, they can't wait to get back to school and there's going to be some sort of envy about the fact that the older sibling has gone back and they're not. Um, for a lot of children, they might actually feel relieved that they don't have to go because they feel anxious about going back to school. So I think it really, really depends. I think it's worth a conversation with that child. If the question is also um, about is, is the child at home going to be anxious that the older child might contract COVID, um, that's another story as well. And I think it's worth a conversation. And it's really important that the children at home know and understand what the process and procedure is with regard to um, testing and social distancing so that they feel safe as well. Thanks, Thank please. you so much. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Shraga, there's a question about davening. Can you please speak a little bit about that and how that's going to work? Um, <laughs> sure. Um, I haven't thought about that. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously the government has given permission um, for us to, to pray as long as the congregation isn't bigger than 50. My guess is at this stage, um, we're, we're not going to have traditional um, tefillah as we know it. I know that the rabbi is looking to have um, some kinds of groups that we would have on the open field. But at this stage, we have had, and I really would like to thank Rabbi Renan, we have had an online tefillah every single morning. And at this stage, I think that that's what we will stick with. I'm not going to, um, in, 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 in keeping with all um, shuls at this stage, we certainly won't be having traditional tefillah. You can see. Okay. Thank you. That brings me on to my next question, because if we did have traditional tefillah, we would need to bring Sidarim to school. So there are questions about the school bags, sanitizing, handing in assignments, passing notes, books, that sort of thing. If you could please address that for the audience. So, yeah, so I think that um, the bags I'll ask Mr. Johnson to, but I have seen that the matrix, the matrix have hardly brought in bags. If anything, they're just small like canvas bags. They put in the, the really essentials. I think the biggest bag that they carry is their lunch. But the truth is that they haven't brought in all those big country road bags. Um, and um, it's, they seem to have contained it. 
I think that one of the things that online teaching has given us, and certainly Teams as a platform, is that children can turn their work in online. There is no actually any longer any need for there to be paper. The only subject, um, there are I think three subjects that, we, that we're struggling a little bit with at this stage, but I have no doubt we'll work it out. And that would probably be math, science, and certainly Hebrew because the children don't know a Hebrew keyboard. Um, but certainly for the rest, every single subject, the kids have turned in all their work online. There really is no reason for us to be using paper. And the beautiful thing also about smartphones is that you can have the Sidur online. So all in all, we are sorted, we are ready to go. And um, you know, if there is a necessity for paper, um, we obviously wouldn't touch it straight away. And there would be maybe just a delay in the marking of it, but we're trying very, very hard to ensure as we have done in the last couple of weeks that everything is turned in online. Uh, about the bags, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, fine. I think there's a degree of uncertainty with regards to the virus and how long it lasts on a particular surface. But it certainly can be the case because it's there with clothing of which we're advised to change every single day. And uh, whilst I'm on the point, it's the same with the masks that you're being given two masks by the school so that you can wash one of a night of a night time and then wear a clean one the following day. The same with your clothes. So my advice to the to the matrix before they returned last week was to actually sanitize their own bags and to take their own responsibility. So just give it a good spray and then where possible, place it in bright sunshine and leave it there for as long as you possibly can. That also will assist in any kind of reduction. Can I just make one more point? Thank you, Tom, I absolutely agree with you. And the, and the question around school uniform, um, one of the reasons that, uh, that we've allowed the students to wear civvies, specifically the matrix, is for that exact reason, that you should be changing your clothing every day. And we made a decision that it would be unfair for matric students at this stage to have to buy new uniforms. It wouldn't be fair. And the other thing is that we could ensure that they were changing their clothes every day. Um, we can't be sure about their jeans, but certainly we would see if they were wearing the same T-shirt all the time. Um, if we bring our grade 11s back before the end of the second term, the... the um, Civis rule will apply and we're hoping in the same we've agreed myself and Mr. Baker that by the third term we will be back please God in school uniform. Thank you so much Mishraga. There are quite a few other questions but I'm just concerned about time. Um, Dan do you want to weigh in there? Yeah, so from my side, I'm, I'm happy. If you, want to, if you want to answer a few more questions, then go ahead. There's still a lot of people, most people are still here, and I, I'm assuming they do want answers to their questions. So maybe go for another five minutes. Okay, great. Thank you. Mishraga, I know that you did answer this question before regarding the metric dance, and I'm sure you'll tell your April Fool's Day story, but... Please Actually, tell it was today. a Purim spill. I, I said <laughs> April Fools, but I remembered we were already on lockdown and I was trying to think what it was. And it oh, was that's a Purim right. spill. And I had been begged by the head student leaders to just play a joke on them. And I joked that there would be no matric dance. Um, you know, it's not in my hands. Uh, I think that a matric dance is a rite of passage. It's our, our way of saying goodbye to the matrix always in the most beautiful, beautiful way. And all I can say is that maybe if it's not 2020, we'll have something in 2021. Um, but um, I, again, it's one of those difficult questions, but please God, we can do something and um, they deserve it. They really do. Thank you. So from the, the fun of a metric dance to the stress of exams, there's suddenly a flurry of questions around examinations for all the grades. Um, not even necessarily the grade 11s. I can see there's a grade eight parent asking if it's possible to write the exams on the campus and um, staggering the, the people on the campus just to maintain the integrity of the examinations. So thank you and to, to, to those parents that have asked. Um, I think that's a very, very important question. Unfortunately, this time round, we would not have the capacity to have um, from grade eight to grade 11, all students writing exams. Um, it, 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 it's impossible. Um, we would exceed what they refer to as capacity. 
So the grade eights, nines and tens are writing online. Um, Mr. Adamson and Mr. Angelo will be sending out um, um, information on a platform called exam.net. It is a platform that was used in Sweden. It was first trialed in Sweden when they were moving much of their education online. Um, one of the reasons that we've sent out forms are we asking the parents and all we can do is hope that the integrity and the in the um, honesty will prevail. There are certain things that make sure that the exam actually is integrous. The, the grade 11s, however, will write at school. And perhaps this is just an opportunity to make it quite clear. One of the reasons that we're so anxious to get the grade 11s back is that the grade 11s apply to university on their grade 11 results. And therefore, we need to protect the integrity of the exam. So I respect parents that will choose not to send their children back. And when I say choose, I'm not talking about students that have comorbidities or children whose parents would be at risk. But there are parents who I understand that are um, just anxious for their kids to come back. Those kids will write online, but we, and of course we would mark them and we would give them the deserved feedback, but we would, wouldn't count them because um, I wouldn't be able to, in good faith, submit results to the universities having children having written at home. So what we will do is that we will encourage children to write at school. I will make every single availability for children to write in isolated um, classrooms, for them literally to come onto the campus and write, because they are going to need a good year mark um, so they would need to write in June and in November. And I think Lisa and Meryl and the rest of the counseling department will bear me out. Children that don't write exams in June and only then write in December, it has always proved very, very um, detrimental to those students, which means that they wouldn't have written for a year. So I am going to encourage grade 11s to write the examinations at school. But at this stage, the grade eight, nines and tens will write on a platform called exams.net. Please look out for all the correspondence and my, my um, advice is start practicing. It comes with practice examples and with a lot of questions and answers. And of course, um, Mr. Angelo would be available at any time to answer any of those questions. Right. Thank you so much. If there's time for one more question, which I'd like to direct towards Meryl, um, it's a question about will the grades be briefed in terms of all the rules before they come back? So um, I think that's a very important question and I think yes they will and they should be and this is one of the platforms that we're using. Um, when you talk about rules, at least what kind of rules, were they talking about the rules of social distancing? Um, because yes, we had a meeting with the matrix and Mr. Johnson spoke to them, Ms. Schwager spoke to them, and I think it is very important, and I think that's something that we will definitely do. They need to know, but I think more importantly is that the parents need to do that as well, because we can speak, but I think about coming, Karen was speaking about people coming back to school, being so excited to see their friends, wanting to hug them, wanting to touch, doing all that kind of stuff, and they need to understand the reason behind it. If they understand that if I come home and I've got COVID, I can impact my grandmother, what will happen if I am not cautious at school? So again, I think that the parents need to discuss it, take responsibility um, to inform their, their, their kids how this will work, and we will definitely also inform each grade how that will work as well. If I can just say absolutely that we have an, we will have an orientation for every returning grade as we had for the matrix and we will inform them of, of, of what, what has to happen on campus. But it's, it, it is, it's happening and it's working and um, the kids are satisfied and I must be honest we also felt like hugging them but refrained from it but um, I can assure you that we would not bring back one single grade without ensuring the safety of the staff and of your children. Thank you so much, Ms. Shaga. And we can attest to the fact that we have happy children on the campus. It is Very wonderful good. to see them. It is a privilege to see those smiling faces again. Thank you to all of our panelists. Jan? 
Yeah, thank you, Lisa. You handled it like an absolute pro. Thank you to our fantastic panelists. Uh, I think you handled everything absolutely professionally and well. Uh, and I, for one, 16 years after finishing my trick, I think I've got a bit of FOMO. I'd also like to go back to school. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I've got, uh, I've got Simon Sinek up here next to me, and I've posted the link in the chat, as we mentioned earlier this evening. It is on Thursday night at 8 p.m. So the link to register is there. There's been an unbelievable response already. Over 2,600 people have registered. We're going to be streaming it through to YouTube as well. Uh, so register for that and yeah, we're very, very excited. We're raising funds for Africa to Kun on Thursday night. So all the proceeds there will go to Africa to Kun. Uh, and last but not least, we have been recording the session. You've probably seen the little red button uh, in the top left that we are recording. I will share the link with uh, Lisa and the team and the link will be made available to, to watch the recording of this. So yeah, thanks to everyone once again and we'll chat soon. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Thanks to all the panelists. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Good night. Thank Take care. Good night. Bye-bye.